All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. And I always like, when we're in the book of Revelation, because there's a promise for reading, I always like to read it. So um, we'll just go chapter, as whatever chapter we're in, we'll just read the chapter to begin the study. Um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the Faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, and even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you've seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So we're introduced to uh, this book that will come to us. Uh, it, it, the setting uh, in which it's delivered to John is given to us very briefly. Uh, we're told that he's in exile on an island that's called Patmos, and that God gave this message to Jesus, and that Jesus sent and signified it to John by his angel. So uh, John has Uh, a vision here of Jesus where he sees Jesus uh, glorified and then chapter 2 and 3 are the beginning of the message and there are specific messages to the seven churches that are referenced uh, here in chapter 1. So uh, that's just the introduction. We'll have an outline for the whole book in this chapter, uh, verse 19. If you want to try to understand the book of Revelation, you want a really simple, a real simple outline Uh, He says, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So write the things you've seen, that's going to be chapter 1. The things that are, that's chapters 2 and 3. The things that are going to happen after this, that's chapter 4 to the end. So you guys that like real simple uh, outlines, that's a real simple outline. Now if you Google Revelation Timeline, or Revelation outline, you will find some very complicated uh, timelines and outlines of the book of Revelation. Uh, There's different views that people have of the book of Revelation, but uh, I like what Jesus 
tells John here. You're going to write the things you see, which is the vision that he has right here. The things which are, that's the state of the churches, chapters 2 and 3. And then chapter 4, even the very words in the original language, meta tauta, or after these things, after this. Uh, it's actually the same exact phrase that's used. And so John's going to see what he sees on the island, a state of affairs that exist, and then what's going to happen in the future. So the book of Revelation is... Uh, an unfolding of, of events that will take place. And that's what we get back in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. The word translated as shortly uh, can have two meanings. The first and most often way that the word is used, it has to do with sudden, suddenly or quickly. And because it means that, it's also used to signify something that's going to happen in a short amount of time. So uh, this message was given 2,000 years ago, so I guess if one day is like 1,000 years, 1,000 years is like one day, then it was only given two days ago. So if time is irrelevant to you, then you can say, hey, this is going to happen soon. It's been two days. Like, Lord, it's been 2,000 years. Um, Definitely, though, I think uh, when you think of Jesus teaching on um, his return or the end of, of days, the emphasis from Jesus is about the suddenness of it. That He talks about watching and being ready and being aware and don't let it come upon you like a thief. And he warns it will come like a thief. Behold, I'll come, it'll be like a thief in the night. No man knows the day or the hour. So I think the emphasis from the Lord was that, yes, it, we need to not think of this as something that's going to be so remote in the future that we don't really have to worry about it ourselves. We need to think of it in terms of it's happening soon because of the crucial attitude of the suddenness of it. If you, have you ever been robbed? Isn't that a, it's a terrible feeling. You think, oh, I thought I heard a noise outside. We had our van over 20 years ago. Our van was stolen off our driveway. Oh, man, I was so mad. I, I, was, I came out, and I, at first I came out. It wasn't parked in the driveway And so I somehow, you know, I don't know how your brain is, but I started looking down the street for where it was. And and I'm looking this way, and I'm like, man, it's not parked down there. It's not parked. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, have you ever parked your van way down the street? You know, like, what am I doing? And it it was like, man, a thief came, and, oh, you know, we just weren't ready. And, And so Jesus makes an emphasis on being ready. And I think that, uh, one, you know, if you even tell people, like, oh, you should come to church, check it out, you know, uh, we're going through the book of Revelation, you're going to get scoffers. I mean, Peter warned and said scoffers are going to come, say, where's the promise of his coming? Everything's going as it's always been. Uh, we're warned from the first century on, it's been the same. There's people that scoff and go, everybody's been saying, everybody thinks they're the, like, you know what, one generation, like, if you're the generation that it is the time, and you're a scoffer, that is the wrong time to be a scoffer. <laughs> when is the right time to be a scoffer? Never. That would be dumb. <laughs> it's like the person that's, you know, uh, mocking God's going to keep his promise. Are you kidding? No, God's going to do it. And if, it, if I was wrong and I lived my life with the sense of the immediacy of the return of Jesus, am I going to regret that? Am I going to go, wow, I could have really been sinning. Man, I could have... I could have really procrastinated on a bunch of stuff, man. The Lord, I mean, I, I could have delayed obedience on so many things. Why did I sacrifice? Why did I live so much for heaven? I could have really lived for my flesh. No. Uh, he's, these, are, these are the things that are going to happen suddenly, and we need to think of them in terms, the phrase that's used by the, 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 Christi, the Christianese, the Christian term is imminence, the imminent return of Christ, that... that uh, Every generation of believers ought to be living as though, hey, we don't know when this stuff's going to happen. I mean, we need to be ready. And uh, just because other generations thought that it was going to happen in their day doesn't somehow get me off the hook. I don't know how you could look at the times that we're living in and not lift up your head and say, our redemption draws near. Uh, the technology uh, to, is, in, is in place for some of these verses that you would wonder, like, how would that have been fulfilled before this generation? Uh, I've, been, I've been reading through the book of Revelation this week, and, uh, and one of the things I noticed was several places where you think, boy, there's just, there's just no reason to think that these events could not unfold in our lifetime. So, you know, I'm not saying that they will, but I think that we're told 
verse 1, these are the things that God gave him to show his servants because they're going to happen. They, mu- they, they must shortly take place. There's a suddenness and a nearness to these things, and we need to get a hold of that. As we pointed out this morning, I think the most important phrase is the first phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation simply means unveiling. It's a revealing. It's a, it's a bringing something forward that you didn't see. So this is primarily a revealing of Jesus. That's how you need to think of it. And I think the point that we made this morning about that is when you're coming to places where you become confused or you get to the part where the judgments are just being poured out and you think, oh my goodness, I don't know if I can read about any more catastrophe. Uh, it's just so heavy. Just you know, step back from it and think, okay, what is this whole section here? You know, If I'm in the trumpet judgments or the bowls of wrath that are being poured out, this, what is this revealing about Jesus? And uh, what is this showing me about, about his power, his righteousness, his, his authority? And, uh, and grab hold of what's the revelation of Jesus and all of it. I think it'll really help you. I know that's, that's what I retreat to as I'm reading through, and, and, it, um, and I get disturbed either by things I don't understand or by just the heaviness of the book. So it's the revelation of Jesus. That's primarily what's going to happen. And... And we need to remind ourselves this is not the revelation of the Antichrist. The goal of the book of Revelation is not by the time we're done, we're going to know that it's Henry Kissinger. Because people used to think it was Henry Kissinger. Well, they were wrong. It wasn't Henry Kissinger. Um, I don't think that the main point of any Bible prophecy is for us to identify who the characters are, except for one character, that's Jesus. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of Antichrist. We're not interested in the one who will take Jesus' place, so... Uh, he's coming. We know when he comes, you'll go, yep, yep, there he is. He's making everybody take a mark. Or if our view of the rapture is correct, you won't even have to worry about it. You'll be snatched out of here. You're, you know, the presence of the church in the world is what's restraining him, according to 1 Thessalonians, if you read it a certain way, the way we read it. So, or I should say the way I read it. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place, he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So this is the John that we read about in the Gospels, one of the original of the 12 disciples of Jesus, written probably around 95 AD. So this lets you know that John was a young guy when he was with Jesus. He's now an elderly man. And according to church tradition, during the persecution uh, of the emperor, I think Domitian, um, John according to the tradition, is, is, has been boiled in oil and somehow survived and had his eyes gouged out and they put him in exile on this island. So what do you do with someone when you try to kill them and you can't kill them? You put them in exile. <laughs> like, okay, well, we'll let you live, you know. And uh, that's according to the church uh, account of this, the church history. Um, so he's on the island of Patmos and he gets this message uh, from Jesus Uh, Verse 2, he describes himself, he's the one who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. It's interesting that John gets to give us the gospel of John, the account of the historical three years, primarily the three years of ministry of Jesus with his disciples, dying on the cross, rising from the dead. And then John also gets to give us the revelation, the future ministry of Jesus. What a privilege, what a what a blessing. Remember when John and his brother came to Jesus and said, we know what we want you to do in our lives. We want to sit at your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? A no. Right? He said, no, you can't. That's not yours. That's not what I have for you. But, you know, Jesus came into his kingdom and there were two guys on his right hand and his left hand. Who were they? There were two thieves who were crucified. So, I mean, they probably were like, oh, wow, praise the Lord. He didn't answer my prayer. <laughs> I, you know... And so James, the first one of the 12 to give his life as a martyr for his testimony, and John, the last of the 12 to die, and in a sense, you know, in exile, so essentially as a martyr. But John, what a privilege to be the one uh, giving the gospel of John and then also being given the privilege of giving the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think at the end of his running his race, thinking, oh, wow, Lord, I wanted something. I had no idea what I was asking for. And look what you did in my life. Way, way, way more than what I would have ever dreamed. And isn't that our testimony, all of us? Aren't you glad that God has answered no to so many of your prayers? You know, Lord, let me marry this person. They're the one. And then you 
Like, oh, thank you, Lord, for saying no to that. Or, Lord, I need this. I need it so bad. Or, this is the job. If I had this job. And the Lord's like, that is not the job for you. And then, you, then the Lord gives you the job for you, and you think, oh, boy, man, I dodged a bullet. And, and you know, uh, I, I sort of had, a, had made a, a, a whole, hopefully a lifetime commitment with the Lord of whenever I pray something dumb, please just ignore me. And uh, I try to I remind myself of that prayer. I know the Lord remembers it, but I remind myself and pray that, Lord, remember any of you keep me, you know, if I'm, if I'm asking for something dumb, don't let me learn by experience. Uh, I want to just, just step in and say, dumb idea, son. We're not doing that. Uh, it's interesting here, John gets to bear witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, all the things that he saw. What a, what a testimony. The gospel of John in the book of Revelation, uh, giving an account of Jesus, who he is, his identity. Then verse 3, he gives a blessing. This is one of seven Blessings, or the word that is used for the blessings, are beatitudes. So when you hear the phrase beatitude, that's one of those sentences that begins with the word blessed. And that's not a scary, overly religious thing, because the word blessed simply means to be made happy. So if you walked in the house after church, and your roommate you was home, and you, you walked in, you smelled chocolate chip cookies. That look on your fla- that face, that's blessed, right? That's, or you know, you... You know, you open, you got your birthday present, you open it up, and you're like, oh, that's blessed. Blessed just means blessed. It means you're made happy. So these are the things that make a person happy. Verse 3, here's the first of seven that are in the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So you want to be blessed? Read the book of Revelation. Now, are you blessed when you read the book of Hebrews? Absolutely. Are you blessed even when you read the book of Jeremiah? I mean, I've just been reading Jeremiah, and it's a heavy, he's a weeping prophet. But you, you could say any book of the Bible, you're going to be blessed when you read it. This one comes with a money-back guarantee. I mean, like right there in black and white, you're blessed if you read it. And, and if someone's reading it to you, if you hear the words of this prophecy, you're going to be blessed. But also, there's a third Keep the things that are, which are written in it. The book of Revelation is going to have a purifying effect on you if you're, if you're reading it and listening to it properly. It, it, I've seen many, many people who become in, love, they become in love with prophecy. It's almost like they're more in love with prophecy than they are in love with Jesus. Uh, you start to talk about Jesus, they're not that interested. Boy, you start talking about some prophetic potential and every, you know, they're all abuzz and excited. We're not looking for that, and so that's, that's what John's getting at here. It's okay to read, know about it, listen to it, hear it, but remember, uh, keep the things that are, that are written in it. It's, this, this is a book that's really designed to reveal Jesus to us and help us understand him and surrender to him and obey him. So a blessing there. Uh, I'll just read to you um, all, if you want to turn to them, you can flip through Revelation. Here, we'll just go through all seven of the Beatitudes. So there's here. Chapter 1, verse 3, then chapter 14, if you want to turn over there. Chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So that's a blessing. If you, uh, there's going to be a lot of people die in the book of Revelation. The ones that are blessed are the ones who die in the Lord. There's going to be a bunch of people who will die in their sin. So blessing if you die in the Lord. Chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest, they, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So that's a great blessing. You don't want to be naked and have everybody see that. So Jesus is coming suddenly, so you're going to be blessed. If you're living like I'm coming suddenly and you're prepared and you're clothed, because if I come suddenly and you're not prepared, that's not going to be good. Chapter 19, the rest of them are near the end. Chapter 19, verse 9, he said to me, write, blessed are those who, who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What an awesome blessing that's going to be. Do you realize that Jesus is going to throw a feast? A marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb to his bride, the 
church taken out of the world and now the, the expression of that and this wonderful celebration. So blessed to be part of that. Chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. All the people who are in Jesus Christ, are, and they're saved, they're washed from their sins by the blood of Jesus, they're all part of the first resurrection. If you're not part of the first resurrection, the second resurrection is a resurrection of the dead for judgment. And the followers of Jesus are in the first resurrection and their names are in the book of life. If your name's not in the book of life, you're not part of the first resurrection. The second resurrection is the resurrection of judgment. And the people who are resurrected for that, their names aren't in the book of life. So it's, it's you're in one or the other. Everyone gets resurrected, okay? So a person says, well, I don't even believe in a resurrection. Well, it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. It's going to happen to you, okay? You're going to get resurrected. You're in the first one or, or you're in the other one. And you want to be in the first one. So blessed are those who are in the first because over them the second death has no power, has no authority. So you want to be saved, be part of the first one. What a blessing and what a tragedy if you're, if you're not part of that. So chapter 22, verse 7 is the sixth of the Beatitudes. 22, verse 7, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. It's interesting that three so far of these blessings are related to uh, keeping what he said and being prepared for him. And then the last one is verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. So seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Isn't that interesting? You're going to see a lot of sevens. There's going to be a lot of groups of sevens. Uh, we'll see in a second here that it's written to seven churches. Those are not the only churches. There are other churches, and, but seven is going to be repeated uh, as a grouping of, of, uh, of churches, of trumpets, of seals, of bowls of wrath, repeated over and over again. So uh, verse 4, we have the, the greeting to the churches, John. So he's now addressing the churches, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, um, or we, we would probably translate this to seven of the churches which are in Asia. There, there are more churches that are in Asia than these seven. Um, this is not Asia when you think of China or India or what we would call Asia today from India all the way you know, towards the Pacific Ocean. Um, this is modern-day Turkey. That was Asia um, from the Greek perspective, so... Asia Minor is what we would call it, or Turkey. So these are all cities that are in Turkey. He says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, and a blessing, grace, and peace. So grace and peace to you. Grace to you and peace from, and we're going to get the Trinity here. We're going to have the Father and the Spirit and the Son. But it's interesting how they're each described here. Uh, gr grace to you and peace from Him, and so this is God, from Him who is and who was and who is to come. So the eternal nature of God emphasized, so the grace and peace coming from God, but as he refers to God, he refers to him in his eternity, the one who is currently, who was, and who also is to come. This is how the Bible's revealed God all along. Uh, I think probably the, the, the best explanation is the name of God in the Old Testament. The name of God, I am. I am that I am. Remember Moses at the burning bush? He's being called by God uh, to go and deliver the people out of Egypt. Moses is now 80. He had a lot of energy. He had a lot of uh, drive at 40 years old. He killed an Egyptian. He's ready to see it happen. And that didn't work out so well. He runs for his life. He flees. He spends 40 years in the wilderness. Now he's 80. He's humble. He's cautious. He's not really keen on getting himself killed or you know, whatever the situation is. And so... God's speaking to him, and God says, I want you to go. And Moses says, you know, and really, it's it's comical chapter. I think it's five excuses that he gives. Uh, when, I mean, if you're talking to a bush, I think you need to give up excuse making. If you've, if you've already begun to respond to the bush, uh, and it's talking to you, and you're answering it back, I think you need to set your excuses aside. But he, one of his excuses, he says, well, what if they ask me what your name is? I don't even know. So I say, like, Bushy, talk to me. You know, like, 
I don't know, I just saw this thing. And what if they ask me? And then God said this, I am that I am. It's a verb. I am that I am. You tell them, I am sent me to you. Now, Hebrew has a, a certain uh, verbal expression that's different than anything we have in English. The, the way that that word is expressed there is not like any way we could express something directly in English. In English, we'd have to say this, the one who is and who was and who is to come. That's, that's exactly how you'd say it, not having the Hebrew form of the verb. The Hebrew means I am, I is, and I am. I am aming, I will be. Like, it's all one. I, I is right now, I is, was, and I is, will be. I am. And when God says I am, he means I was, am, I am, am, I will be, am. And, and it, it means all the tenses, past, present, future. We, we don't, we'd have to say the one who is, God is. Well, when we say that, we mean he, he was and he will be. And that's exactly the name of God, I am. And the name Jesus is I am, the same verb and the word, Hebrew word for salvation. I am your salvation. Well, were you my salvation? Yeah, I was. And I am and I will be. I always am your salvation. So the name of God, I am. So here it is, the one who is and who was and who is to come. So grace and peace from him. And then he says this, and this is, again, uh, interesting, and I think this will help us as we start our study of some of the symbols in the book of Revelation. He says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, when we're talking about the Trinity or the nature of God, we say well, God's a Father and He's the Son and the Holy Spirit. There are three, and these three are one. There's one God, but eternally distinct with Father and the Son and the Spirit. They're not uh, as though it's like, hi, I'm the Father. Wait, hold on. I'm Jesus. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm the Holy Spirit. There's, there's some false teachings in different directions related to the Trinity. It's hard for us to get our brain around it in terms of there's nothing in nature where you have three distinct and yet three being one, uh, it's hard for us to explain it. Now, we get that, we've accepted it, but then you come to a passage like this and says, wait, seven spirits, oh man, no, you messed up. I, was, I didn't even understand the Trinity. Now you're, what do you mean seven spirits who are before his throne? I thought there's just one spirit. What's the answer? Do you know what the answer is? I have an answer. And this is going to be how we're going to try to answer a lot of our, all of our questions, and some of them we'll be able to answer, some of them we won't, um, but here, I think, is a way to answer this. When he says the seven spirits who are before his throne, is there any other place where God's talked about the spirit and there's been a reference to seven, seven spirits? Let's turn back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, we have what we would call a messianic prophecy, a prophecy of the Messiah. And verse 1 of chapter 11, there will come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch will grow out of his roots. It's interesting because the word branch uh, has as its root the same root as the name of Jesus' hometown, Netzer or Natzer, Nazarene. He would be called a Nazarene. Uh, it's actually, the word means a branch. The root of it is a branch. So the picture is, a, is, this is sort of a word picture. Jesse was David's father. The kingdom of David uh, is going to be chopped down like you chop down a tree. Okay, you're going to see an end of the kingdom. David, the kingdom of David was awesome. You know, David is this great trunk and Solomon's so powerful. And then Solomon, you end up, well, oh no, the kingdom splits, right? And so now, you know, you have two kingdoms, and you got the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and, and the sons of David go on, and the northern kingdom falls into idolatry, and there's all this chaos and corruption, and they end up being destroyed by the Assyrians. Many of those people migrate to the south. All the tribes are represented in the south because of the migration of those who wanted to leave idolatry. But the kingdom of David finally falls. The Babylonians conquer and destroy, and it's as though you came along and just chopped the tree down. But Isaiah says... You're going to see out of that dead tree trunk, a rod, a stem, a root is going to come out, a branch, a nitzer, I think is how you'd say it. A branch will go out of his roots. So 
You don't think that when you see the kingdom of David or David's father Jesse, you see it chopped down and you think, well, that's the end of the kingdom of David. Don't say that it's the end of the kingdom of David because it's not. It's going to look like it's chopped down, but out of that is going to come a root. Is that hap- did that happen or not? That has happened, actually. When Isaiah's writing, had it happened? No. Isaiah's writing 150 years before the kingdom of David falls. Roughly 100, 120 years or something. So... Uh, it hasn't happened in Isaiah's day, but he's telling us, hey, listen, uh, you're going to see out of the roots and out of the stem of Jesse this branch come up. A rod is going to grow up, some new growth. And then look at verse 2. About this person who comes, it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, to go on for just a couple of verses. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by the sight of the eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he'll slay the wicked and goes on. Now, who is he talking about? Isaiah 11 is about Jesus, right? The Spirit of God is going to rest upon this person. It's going to look like David's wiped out, but don't think that that's the end because someone's going to come out. And that person that's going to come, he's going to have the Spirit of God upon him, and he, and he describes his ministry. So look at verse 2. How many spirits are going to rest upon Jesus? The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. How many is that? I counted seven. So how many spirits are there in that verse? I'd say it's one. So... You know, I don't think it's like the seven dwarfs of the spirit that are like, I'm, I'm understanding, I'm dopey. Or no, that, it's not there. Spirit of dopey. Uh, I don't think these are, well, there's a spirit of wisdom, there's a spirit of understanding, there's a different spirit that's this one. Uh, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a um, prophetic uh, expression of the perfection of the spirit. And the way that the book of Revelation is going to refer to the Holy Spirit is... In, in this sense of the, the fullness of the Spirit expressed as the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit or seven spirits literally. So uh, in the Old Testament we have here seven spirits and they're all referring to the one Holy Spirit. So personally that's how I interpret it. Now if, if, you, if that doesn't satisfy you, um, find some other thing to satisfy you because this is not the only time he says this. Okay? So look at chapter, go back to Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. When we get into the seven letters of the seven churches, you'll see that each one of the letters starts with a reference to some part of the vision and the, the revelation of Jesus that's in chapter 1. Some aspect of his nature is, is brought forward and, and, uh, and is kind of the basis for the message. So chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So it's referred to there. Also look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 5, when John's then after these things, when he's up in heaven and he begins to see the future, he sees the heavenly scene in chapter 4, verse 5. From the throne proceed lightning, thundering, and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So seven lamps burning, but those seven lamps are actually signifying the seven spirits of God. Now we know there's only one spirit of God, so um, we're going to have to interpret this in light of other scripture, which I think the Isaiah passage is probably the best. And then chapter 5, verse 6. I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. And the seven eyes are signifying something. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth? So seven lamps, well, those are a symbol of what? Of the seven spirits of God. The seven eyes that you see in this chapter, well, those are actually symbolic of what? They're symbolic of the seven spirits of God. And you say, well, I don't even know what the seven spirits of God are. You're totally confusing me. Exactly. Uh, all, of these, all of these passages, 
when he'll, he's going to say, if this is used symbolically, this is what it represents. We don't have to wonder what these seven fires are. He tells us that's the seven spirits of God. The seven eyes that he sees on the Lamb, those are the seven spirits of God. You say, well, that's, this is not, this is confusing. Well, let's keep being confused. Turn to Zechariah. I just want you to see that these, we've seen Isaiah talk about the Spirit of God, but then describe Him in a sevenfold way. Then we see this repeated emphasis in Revelation of this seven related to the expression of the Spirit as seven spirits. The fullness of the Spirit is how I would interpret it. And that it's repeated. So around the throne are these seven fires, but he says those seven fires that I'm seeing, John knows that, that that's a representation of the Spirit. And then the eyes that he sees in the Lamb, those are a representation of the Spirit. Now the eyes on the Lamb, I want you to notice this. Remember the seven eyes? In Zechariah chapter 4, this is a really powerful passage. Very, very interesting prophecy. Chapter 3 of Zechariah. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. What an ugly vision to have. Can you imagine how uncomfortable this would be? God's going to show you a vision, and the vision you get to see is the high priest of your day, and Satan right there, and Satan is going off on him. I mean, and listen, any one of us in this room, if we have a vision of any one of the others of us in the room, and there you are standing before God, and Satan's going off on the person, you should be feeling sorry for the person, because Satan probably has a lot of material. Oh, I can start... Let me tell you about their whole life. Oh, this is not going to be good for Rich. Oh, please, Lord, get him out. Like, Lord, rescue him. So he sees that, and then verse 2. Thank God, you know, somebody intervenes, and it's the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Who's been snatched right out of the fire? Joshua, the high priest. I mean, Jerusalem is under the judgment, and, and this is after the captivity, and this guy's come back, but he's like a, he's like a, he just pulled, he's like a burnt log right out of the fire, like, this guy's burned up, burned out, and there he is, and Satan's going, look at him, charcoal man, you know, he's all messed up, and the Lord says, hey, knock it off. Verse 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he was standing before the angel. Wow. There's the accuser of the brethren and accuses them before God day and night. Here's this poor high priest in filthy garments. Satan has plenty to accuse him of. Verse 4, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Well, you can't wait for this day, can you? Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I've removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And then I said, let, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. What a radical picture. Satan ready to accuse, and God ready to cleanse and, and rescue this guy. And then, verse 6, Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, and he said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house. And likewise have charge of my courts, and I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua. Here's where it jumps forward to the future. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wonderful sign. Did you hear what he just said? God signifying that these guys now can be thought of as what? What's the word he used? A sign. So we don't have to wonder if we can interpret this. Like, these guys are a sign. So yeah, these are real people. They really live. They have their real experiences. But you can think of Joshua as a sign, a picture of something. Because, look at verse 8, continuing. Behold, I'm bringing forth my servant. And what is he called? The branch. What Bible verse does that make you think of? How many Bible verses have we read so far tonight where Jesus was called the branch? How many can you find in the whole Old Testament where he's called the branch? Which one do you think of? I gave you a big clue. I read you only one. Right? You think, oh, that reminds me of Isaiah 11. 
He's the branch, the rod out of the stem of Jesse. And the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of mind, the sevenfold spirit of God is going to rest upon him. You, Joshua, are a sign, and I'm going to bring forth my servant, the branch. Look at verse 9. Behold the stone that I've laid before Joshua. Upon that stone are seven eyes. And behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord. And look at the end of verse 9. Underline, if you're not an underliner, maybe break your rule on this one verse. This is a great verse. Look at the end of verse 9. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. When did that happen? Is there, is there one particular day in history where God removed the iniquity of the land? Yeah. What day is that? It's the day Jesus Christ died on the cross. The branch that would come that Joshua is going to be a picture of. Now, you can read Zechariah chapter 4 for yourself, right? We get into this picture of these two trees, and we'll, we'll save it for later because the two trees are actually mentioned in Revelation. So um, you can save that for the, because for, we'll come back to this section um, in a few weeks. But the servant, the branch, the seven eyes. What did Revelation say? We read it in chapter 5, um, verse 6. The lamb who has how many eyes? Seven eyes. And we're told the seven eyes are what? The seven spirits of God. And this passage that talks about the seven eyes reminds us of what other passage? The branch. So when, you're, when you come to the book of Revelation, you're going to be needing to go like this in your Bible, like a slinky. Why? Because most of the symbolism in the book of Revelation it's going to be referred to some other place, all right? Now you might say, well, I would never have been able to do that. Rich, you know the Bible and this is hard. Well, study the Bible. Get better at it, okay? There's probably some things that you're an expert at. Some of you guys, oh, you guys aren't here that are baseball fans, but when you're watching this later in your home and you're watching the Dodgers and the Astros, you should have been here tonight. I'm, uh, no. Uh, you know, I'm sure somebody who follows baseball can tell us what Kershaw's uh, ERA is or they know their favorite baseball players, all the stats. What, like, you know about whatever you're interested in. This is not, I mean, the book of Revelation is only this many pages, okay? I got my concordance attached to it. In my Bible, it's only this many pages. Okay. That's how many pages? That's not like unlimited amount, okay? So just to give you an exhortation, don't be intimidated by it. It's obviously, it does take time. Don't beat yourself up that you don't know everything that you want to know. But you don't have to look at the book of Revelation as some magical book that you have to have eaten magic mushrooms to understand or only, you know, some people can understand it. No, just... It's in the Bible, okay? Seven spirits of God. We, we looked at the passages that are re relevant within the book of Revelation, and they reminded us of the passage in Zechariah. The passage in Zechariah took us right back to the passage in Isaiah. The stem that's from Jesse and the seven eyes. Are like, oh, that's, that's this. So the seven spirits of God, it's not saying that there's seven spirits in that sense. In this case, we're being reminded of the imagery that God's used to express to us the reality of his spirit. So there are, there are going to be times where we're looking at something that says it's like this. Other times, images that are used that help us to have a greater understanding. And there are sometimes, but very few times, but sometimes where we look and we go, I don't even know what that means. I'm not sure. And, and God didn't tell us everything we want to know. There's one place where uh, John starts to write down what he heard, and, and he's told, no, stop, don't write that. And I always get to that part of the book, and I always go, ah. Oh. That probably would have helped us understand all the stuff we don't understand, and then you didn't give it to us. Um, so we got what we got. Um, thankfully, this first chapter, though, it's, it's mostly interpretive for us. So that's the seven spirits before us, and I hope that helps you as you read that. You didn't you know, get too confused by uh, wondering, well, what does he mean, seven spirits? So let's continue. So we had the nature of God, the eternal nature, him who was and who is and who is to come, the complete nature, this fullness of the Spirit, the seven spirits uh, who are before his throne, which reminds us of Zechariah and reminds us of Isaiah. And then verse 5, Jesus, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, 
the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Jesus is the faithful witness. Now, that would be probably from the New Testament. Jesus is is the perfect revelation of God. John chapter 1. John's the one who told us that he is the, the perfect, he's the word of God become flesh. God wanted to express himself. Jesus is the perfect re- re- representation of God. He's the firstborn from the dead in that he's, he's above all. Uh, the first out of the grave, but also really the one who has the place of preeminence, Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And Here's part of the revelation of Jesus, the ruler of the kings of the earth, ruler over the kings of the earth. And this probably is a reference back also to Psalm 2. Remember in Psalm 2, uh, it's a psalm of the father giving the son the promises and ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So the promise that's always been given to the son as as a king. He's going to fulfill the promises to David as a king. He's the ruler and this book is going to give us the the revelation of Jesus taking his rightful place as king of the earth. That's what we're going to see unfold in this book. So, having said that about Jesus, he then gives him a blessing. Um, he, he gives them a blessing from the Father and the Spirit and the Son, and then now he gives Jesus a blessing for this reason. In the middle of verse 5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he gives Jesus this blessing because of his work on the cross and his work in our lives. So I don't know if you realize this, but you've been made a king and a priest. So you're actually, as far as God's concerned, you're royalty and you have a ministry as a priest. Now you say, well, wait a minute, I'm a girl. I, I'm not a priest. priest. Girls can't be priests. Well, apparently... They can in Jesus' kingdom. So you're a priest. So if someone comes to you at Calvary Chapel, they go, hey, do you guys have priests here? And you go, well, I'm one of them. Uh, but, you know, you can't really get too puffed up because everybody else is too. So, uh, but, you know, it's, would it not be true? It's like, well, well uh, you know, who's the leader right here? Well, I don't know. I'm a king. Uh, well, I mean, I, that makes me a leader, but I'm a king. Like, oh, you're a king? Well, yeah, so are they. So is she. He is too. In the kingdom of God, well, God's, we're all joint heirs with Jesus. So he's, he's washed, he's taken away our sins like that passage in Joshua. God's removed, God took away that guy's dirty robes and, and the accusations of the devil and took away the sin of the land. Jesus has washed us and then he's, he's made us kings and priests. Awesome. To him be glory forever and ever, amen. Then uh, this is part of the revelation. Behold, he's coming with the clouds Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And he says, even so, amen. Now, verse 7 is a reference to several passages in the Old Testament. He's coming with the clouds. Well, it might remind you of Jesus. Turn back to Matthew 24. Jesus says in Matthew 24, when he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and his own uh, coming to establish his kingdom... Matthew chapter 24, in verse 30, he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Does that verse sound familiar? It's almost word for word what we just read in Revelation. This will give you a a clue. If you want to write a good book, quote Jesus. And quote them accurately, and people will think you're awesome. I mean, when we share the Word of God with people, we want to share the Word of God, share what God said, you know? And so John is essentially reminding us of what Jesus said, but Jesus is reminding us of what? Well, what Daniel said. First, Daniel 7. Turn back to Daniel 7. We're going to have to look at Daniel related to the book of Revelation. Daniel gives us quite a bit of information about the days of the book of Revelation. We won't get in, I won't give you a lot of background on chapter 7, but just as it relates to um, this particular passage, verses 13 and 14, he, as, as the kingdoms of the world unfold, and he, he finally then sees the establishment of the kingdom of God, verse 13, he says, I was watching in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him, 
And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom, the one which will not be destroyed. So Daniel had seen a vision of kingdom, followed by kingdom, followed by kingdom. But in the days of the fourth kingdom, as it's revived with these ten kings, and this wicked king rises to power, then God's going to send one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven to establish the kingdom. And Jesus, in Matthew 24, is claiming to be the fulfillment of this verse. Now, when some people say, well, I don't believe in Jesus as you know, Messiah, but I think Jesus was a good teacher. You could, all, you could point to this and go, he's a lunatic. <laughs> he's, he claims in Matthew 24 to be none other than this person that Daniel's talking about. He says, you're going to see me coming with the clouds. I'm this person. That's not a good teacher. If I do that, if I say, no, Daniel 7 is me. I'm not a good teacher. Fire me, okay? You have permission to beat me and chase me out of the church building. <laughs> and don't let me back in if I say I'm this guy. That's not a good teacher. That's that's a person who's dangerous, unless, of course, they are this person, and that's Jesus. So coming with the clouds, that's a reference to Daniel 7. And then they'll look on him whom they pierce. Turn to Zechariah again. Zechariah is easy to find. If you can turn forward and find Matthew, Zechariah is only, there's Malachi and Zechariah right before Matthew. So if you can find Matthew, you can find Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 God said, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and then they will look on me whom they pierced. That's interesting. Who are they going to look on? Who got pierced? Who's talking in Zechariah 4? Or Zechariah 12, I'm sorry. It's Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour on the inhabitants of David and on, or on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. And yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. How interesting. It's a prophecy of the return of the, of the, the Jewish people, and they'll recognize the one um, that they pierced, and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for a, an only son. So, um, this, go back to Revelation. This one verse, verse 7, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Daniel 7, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Zechariah chapter 12. So two distinct references in only the one sentence. So when you're going through the book of Revelation, a lot of the places where you're reading are going to be pointing you back to the Old Testament. This is one of the reasons why I think it's really important for churches, for believers, to read the Old Testament. Uh, I've met people who say, well, I just read the Gospels. Well, man, you're gonna, how are you going to understand the Gospels if you don't under, you know, read? Yeah, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of historical information that's important. Uh, okay, when you get to the genealogies, skim them. Okay? There's not, those genealogies have value in terms of establishing the identity of the Jewish people for their time period, but they don't... They don't have value beyond that necessarily. Um, but, you know, if we, just, if we never studied the Old Testament, think of all the... Just we're only in verse... I mean, am I going to get through chapter 1 tonight? I mean, we're just in verse 7, and how many passages in the Old Testament have we looked at to help us understand just the first few verses? So, um, of course, I'm preaching to the choir. We're going through the Bible. We're going to finish Revelation, and where are we going? We're going to go back to Genesis, and we're going to go do it again until... The, but I'm praying for the rapture before we're done, okay? So, and I can't imagine how we could get through the Bible three whole times without the Lord coming back. And I'm pretty sure there's no way we'll be able to do it four times. Steve Edel, I mean, he's keeping track of these. So he's like, I was 55 when you started last time. And man, I don't know, like next time I would be like, I'm going slow. And now you can be like, be like 90 if you keep slowing down. I'll go faster, Steve. Let's just start like one week, be done in a week. We're going to just... So all that, to, all that to just make the point, don't be afraid of the Old Testament, okay? Don't be afraid of it. Read it. Um, you know, some of it's historical. Some of it's amazing prophecy, though. That, like that passage in, in Joshua or Zechariah about Joshua the high priest where there's a prophecy that says, God says, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. What a radical prophecy. Uh, one of m many, many prophecies that we have. So... That gets us through verse 7. Then we have verse 8. 
I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Who is talking in verse 8? Well, it's the Lord, right? That's what we have. Adonai, you know, the, the Lord. Um, who's the Lord? Well, we say, well, Jesus is Lord. So you could say, verse 8, Jesus is talking. You could also say, well, it could be God the Father speaking. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We already had in verse, uh, verse 4, grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who's that a reference to? That's God the Father. But then verse 8 says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So you could say, well, verse 8, that's, let's say it's God. It's the Almighty. So that's the Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm just setting you up because Jesus is going to claim to be the first and the last and the Alpha and the Omega later. It's interchangeable, right? So when somebody has a problem with the identity of Jesus as the unique and only begotten Son of God that makes him one with God, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, you have a real problem with the book of Revelation because Jesus is no one else but God. There's no way around it. So, verse 9, I, John, both your brother, we'll get into the thing that he sees he gives the setting. I am your brother and your companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. Interesting, he doesn't call himself an apostle. I'm your brother. I'm your companion. And what do I share with you? Tribulation, the kingdom, and the patience of Jesus. So what are our lives going to be marked by here on the earth? What are, we are, are we in the same brotherhood as what John's talking about? Are you? In the same brotherhood where you work or where you go to school or where you are you in the are you in the same brotherhood of patience and tribulation and the kingdom? Yeah, you say, yeah, I, I think I'm qualified. I'm in that club. That's the that's my membership. I got some I, I, they're checking I I'm almost gonna get one free. I got all my ten boxes checked for all those. I got some of that stuff going on. Well, that's 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 uh, the way it is for us on earth. We're brothers and we share, we're companions in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus. He says, I'm on the island that's called Patmos. And why was I there? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was being persecuted for being a follower of Jesus. That's it. That was his crime. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's an interesting reference. Which day, what day is the Lord's day? Well, what, what day is the Sabbath day? Sabbath day is the seventh day. It's the last day of the week. Which day is the Lord's day? It's the first day of the week. When someone comes and gives you grief and beef because you go to church on Sunday and they say, oh, it's worshiping the sun. Remember that Saturday is named after Saturnalia. That's a totally pagan god. So, I mean, you, well, you go to worship on, you go to worship on sun, Saturday. That's, you're worshiping Saturnalia? <laughs> you know, it's just the stupid Roman name of the day. We don't worship on this day because it's called Sunday. Why do the believers and followers of Jesus Christ from the New Testament times, we don't find, we find Paul going into the synagogue on the Sabbath evangelizing Jewish people, but every reference in the book of Acts or references in the letters about the day when the believers met, it's the first day of the week. And why do the believers in Jesus meet on the first day of the week? It's what I like to call Easter every week. And that's the way I see it. Paul said, listen, if you want to think of one day as better than the other, and by the way, if you're here and you say, well, I'd really like to keep a Sabbath. That helps me. It helps me keep my mind clear. I take a day of rest. Paul, the Bible says go for it. But just remember, that doesn't make you better than the rest of us. And that doesn't mean that because you have that conviction that we have to have that conviction. There's great liberty. So Paul says one person thinks of every day as the same. One person thinks of one day as better. He said, just, just do what's your own conviction, but don't think that one day makes you better, the other day makes you less, and don't judge each other. But here, the, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It's a reference to the first day of the week. And I heard behind me a loud voice, and he said, like a trumpet. Uh, and this voice says, verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Well, remember verse 8, we weren't sure who was talking, but it was the Almighty. So we maybe say, well, I think... That's God talking. He's the Almighty. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Well, a few verses later, we know who's talking here. This is Jesus, because the rest of the chapter is about this person. Um, 
He calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. So how many Alpha and Omegas are you allowed to have in your alphabet? One. One Alpha. I mean, like, that's the whole point of saying the A to the Z. You don't have, like, well, we have A and then subscript A. You know, God's the capital A, and Jesus is the lowercase a. I mean, I guess a cultist would say something like, you know, I mean, don't the Jehovah's Witnesses actually, when they say Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? A God, little g. And you think, oh, come on. Because in Greek, actually, the word order is flipped, and it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And if you read it in Greek, it says, God was the Word. That's kind of hard to misinterpret right there. That's that, and if you look at it, get any Greek New Testament, it'll, you can look at the word order. So, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. That's, that's God, that's Jesus. So, here's his command. What you see, remember, uh, we saw in verse uh, 19, the order, the, this, this very basic organization or outline, write the things which you've seen. That's chapter 1, and that's what he says here in verse 11. Write the things, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. So what you've seen, uh, the things which are, that's chapters 2 and 3, I believe, and then the things which will take place after this, the after this starts in verse, or chapter 4. So the churches are named uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You know another church in Asia, Asia Minor, it's actually a book in the New Testament. Colossians, Colossae is a city in Asia Minor. How did they get off this list? Well, did you read through chapters 2 and 3? Do you want Jesus writing you a letter and having it be public? Do we want, to the church, Calvary Chapel in Elk Grove, California, I have this to say. Oh, please don't publish it, Lord. Don't put that on the internet. Please don't tweet it, God. Don't put that on your Facebook page. I mean... Colossi dodged a bullet. I mean, so this is, these seven churches are not the entirety of every single church. It's just the seven churches that were chosen. There might be reasons for that. We'll talk about that when we get there. So he hears this and he turns to look. I turned and I, to see the voice that spoke to me. And then the first thing he sees is the setting. Seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, this person the son of like a someone like a man a human being the son of man and he's clothed with a garment all the way down to his feet so a full length robe and then a, a belt around his chest of gold his his head and his hair were white like wool as white as snow so just pure white the head and the hair pure white radiant and his eyes were like a flame of fire it doesn't say his eyes were a flame of fire but like a flame of fire Then, verse 15, his feet were like, not that they were, but they were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So just majesty, as he expresses himself, it's like a waterfall. So you think of verse 11. The voice is like this waterfall, a voice like a trumpet, and it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And you look, and he's radiating like the sun in his strength, and you're trying to, like, his feet are like glowing brass. And, and you think, like, okay, <laughs> you are the Alpha and the Omega. Like, no argument for me. In verse 16, in his right hand are seven stars. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Now, is that image uh, elsewhere in the Bible, sharp two-edged sword? Is that interpretive for us in the Bible? Do we have to wonder what this is? What's like a sharp two-edged sword in the Bible? The Word of God. So what's coming out of the mouth of Jesus? The word of God. So, see, Revelation's not hard. You guys already got it all figured out. (laughs) Chapter one's the easy chapter, okay? And uh, his countenance like the sun shining in its strength. So such glory, he can't even take it in. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This has always been significant to me because John was so intimate with Jesus. He refers to himself in the Gospel of John as I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. This guy has no fear of Jesus at all. He leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. When, Peter's like, when Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, the person close enough and intimate enough with Jesus that he, you knew the guy's going to get the answer, Peter's like, ask him, ask him, ask him. I mean, you can imagine around the table what it must have, ask him. Shh, 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 Peter, stop it. 
you know, whatever, however it's happening. And then, but then John says, well, who is it? It's the one who dips the bread. Like, John is laying there. I mean, this guy, he's as close to Jesus as you could be. He sees Jesus right here, and what does he do? Fall down dead, like I was dead. What, what's another word for that? Fainted, passed out, collapsed, freaked out. I mean, what, a, like, what word do you use? Um, I fell down his feet as, I was, as if I was dead. Wow, that's a revelation of Jesus. His power, his majesty. He laid his hand on me, his right hand on me, and he said, don't be afraid. Aren't you glad that's Jesus? Uh, it's so awesome that we would be wiped out, but then he puts his hand on it and says, you don't need to be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I'm glad he throws in an amen. He's like, amen, amen. The one who died for us is this person, none other than the first and the last. The one who's so glorious, but he died for us. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Okay, remember this verse because I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but Wednesday night, what are we learning about in Matthew 16? And this Wednesday night, what are we talking about? You don't even know. You're looking at me like, no, I don't know. What are we, do- what are we talking about? I'm totally freaked out by Revelation. <laughs> Jesus says, I've got the keys of the kingdom. And then he gives them to the irresponsible new drivers. He tells Peter, and I have the keys, of the, and I'm giving you the keys. What keys does Jesus have? What authority? If the keys are, keys are representation of authority, right? Like the key, you give someone the key to the city, you got the key to the whatever. This unlocks, it's, you know, you have the, 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 the power of something. And Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to who? That's right, you guys. You guys have the keys of the kingdom. In fact, what you open on earth, it's going to be open in heaven. And what you, what you lock up on earth, it's going to be locked up in heaven. Well, that's pretty radical. So you mean like, like this? Yeah, like that. Okay. You ever watch a little kid when they figure out the light switch? <laughs> Just remember this keys thing. We'll come back. We'll, we'll, we'll tie it more in on Wednesday. So he's got all the authority. He's got the power of the grave. And we'll, we'll see that fulfilled later on in the book of Revelation. Then verse 19, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will be hereafter. So you're going to see this, this vision, the things that are happening, chapters 2 and 3, the things that take place after this. And then verse 20, we, we don't have to wonder what the stars are in the lampstands. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, or seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So there are symbols but they represent something real. This is very important. When you're reading in the Bible and there's symbolic language, it's almost always referring to something real happening, some historical person or historical event. There's a reading of the book of Revelation. I mentioned this this morning. I don't think in both services, but one of the services, I talked about my my education and the Bible college I went to. They didn't offer a class in Revelation when I was there. I was there four and a half years. I got a bachelor's, accredited bachelor's degree in the Bible, liberal arts degree in the Bible and ministry. And uh, they never offered the four and a half years I was there uh, a class in Revelation because they, their view of the book of Revelation was that it's all an allegory. And the, they, would, they would summarize it like this. They would say the book of Revelation is designed to give hope to people who are in trouble. And that none of these things refer to anything in particular. So the, the thing about the Antichrist, this is all just a giant picture, and you could read through the whole picture. None of it's going to actually happen. You could read through the whole picture, and what you'll see is a cycle of the things over and over again, and, 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 and then ultimately God wins, and it's designed to bring comfort to the suffering church. Well, that, that's fantastic, because sometimes when I read the book of Revelation, that's plenty. I'm so happy to read through the book of Revelation and go, wow, God wins. We win. Some of this stuff I don't even understand. Praise the Lord. I mean, we win. I mean, right? That's a takeaway. I don't disagree with some aspect of what they say. The problem with what they say is Jesus said 
The seven stars are the pastors of the seven churches. They're the messengers. The seven lampstands are seven churches. Where are they? They are Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum. I mean, he says these symbols mean these places. So our view of the Bible is when there's symbolic language, we want to pay attention to the symbolic language and try to understand, is it, what's it referring to? Because God does use symbolism, and when he does, it's meaning something. It's pointing to something. We don't really take the view of the Bible that God's speaking allegorically. And I'll give you an example. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament uh, in Micah that says, Out of you, Bethlehem of Judah, shall come forth a ruler. Now, Be- why is Bethlehem significant? Is there a famous person from Bethlehem besides Jesus? Yes. His name is David. That's David's hometown. So you, well, the son of David is going to be born in Bethlehem. There's an easy way to allegorize that because Mary's pregnant, right? She's nine months pregnant. She's going to pop. And they live where? Not Bethlehem. They live in Nazareth. If God's nice, he can allegorize that passage. He can say, well, Bethlehem, you know what Bethlehem means? If you translate Bethlehem, it means house. Beth is house. House of bread. Bethlehem is a house of bread. And who but Jesus brings us the bread of God, right? Jesus, the very bread of God. And when, you say, when we say house of bread in Micah 5, 2, we don't mean literally the house of bread that he's born in Bethlehem. This poor girl, she's nine months pregnant. They live all the way in the north. It's going to be a terrible journey for her. Let's let her li- stay there by her family. She can have the baby. That's going to be way better. They make this journey. What if they get down there? There's no place for them in the inn. What, is she going to have to give birth to the kid in a barn? Lay him in a manger? Let's just allegorize it. Where's Jesus born? Is Jesus the bread of God? Is it appropriate that he's born in a place called the house of bread? Absolutely. Where was he actually born? There. When, when you're reading the Bible, basically it means what it says. When it's using symbolic language, it still means what it says. The symbol's referring to something, and that something is going to happen. <laughs> Now, most of the time, you can figure out what the symbols are referring to. Most all the time. It's not hard. Uh, there's some other passage in Scripture that's going to point you to it. So here's, a, to me, a great example of, of why we look at the book of Revelation. We don't think we're going to be the experts on it. We're not going to argue with people who have a different view of it. We'll smile and say, you know, I've heard of that view. And, you know, I, there's a lot of people, who, you know, but I don't hold to that. But, but I don't, I'm not going to argue with you about it. But I, I would prefer to go to the book of Revelation because in this first chapter, every image that we've seen so far is interpreted for us in the Bible. Every single one in chapter one. Or it's interpreted by Jesus, okay? Um, he tells us the seven stars, what they are, the seven lampstands, what they are, and they're actually physical, real things. So the symbols that we'll find... So when you see a beast coming out of the sea, it's clearly symbolic language. Well, it's representing a kingdom. We're told what it is. It's the Antichrist, and he's going to come out, and we're told specific things that this individual is going to do. So to allegorize it seems to me to go against what we're introduced to through the whole scripture and especially even here at the beginning. So that's a little bit of a justification for how we're going to go through the book of Revelation. We, we think these are real events um, that are going to happen, and... Uh, We're going to look at prophecy like that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for showing us the things that will come to pass. And we pray, Lord, because you seem to have it on your heart and emphasize uh, for us our need to reckon on the suddenness of your coming, that you said, behold, there's a blessing when we recognize that you'll come like a thief so that we keep our clothes, (laughs) so we don't have uh, nakedness and be ashamed. So, Lord, we just close with that prayer. God, help us to live with the sense of the suddenness of your return. And thank you for the unity of the Scripture so that we could go all over the Bible and, uh, and find you speaking to us about these things that would come in the last days. And thank you for letting us uh, have your word in a language you can read and understand. We pray you, you bless us as we read uh, this particular book of the Bible. Give us that blessing that you intend for us to have, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.